thanks so much. I'm very excited to be here. Um, so, let me start by asking, how many of you grew up in suburbia? Not a surprise. Most of our country is suburbia. It's been developed that way. Uh, this is where I grew up. This is 2706 Queen Cannon in Houston, Texas. We moved there when I immigrated from Argentina. Yes, some Houston in the crowd. <laughs> um, and from a very young age, uh, when I was first living here and lived in a couple of different areas around the country uh, in suburbia, um, I realized very early that suburbia is really a product of the automobile, this revolution that we call the automobile, right? Cars came to this country and all of a sudden we could be far away from where we worked. We could go out and have larger yards. We could uh, find cheaper land. And uh, there was all this fantastic stuff that happened because of uh, the car in suburbia. Um, there was also a bunch of stuff that wasn't so great. A lot of social isolation came with that. Uh, huge environmental issues, everything from we consumed a lot of land, uh, we destroyed a lot of habitat, we continued to do that, and we became dependent on this thing, the car, and burned a whole lot of fuel. Um, and then we also started to create fiscal problems within our cities, which we still have today. Right? So uh, many of our cities are actually hurting a whole lot because of the, all the infrastructure they need to support because of this thing called the car and this thing that we call suburbia. Uh, and it led to a lot of urban decay uh, that we're just getting over right now. Imagine, imagine if we had been able to have a little bit of foresight of what was going to happen when we unleashed this thing uh, early in the 20th century. If we knew a little bit of what might have happened, we might have made different decisions and we might have prepared ourselves a little bit better. Well, we're about to hit another one of those revolutions, and that is the autonomous vehicle, the self-driving car. This is a new revolution, it is, and it, it is arriving right now. And while there's been a tremendous amount of research on the technical aspects of this, on sensors, on data, on how we deal with the safety of this, uh, there's been next to nothing of what we've been looking at recently, which is what are the secondary impacts of this technology on cities? I'm an urban designer, a planner, an architect, how are these things going to affect our cities all around us? Uh, about two years ago, we started looking at these topics. And we're, at first, we were very excited that we didn't see a lot of what was going on, uh, um, kind of uh, research around this. It quickly became a, oh my goodness, why aren't we all looking at this? We need to understand what's happening. And what I, one of the themes I want to really uh, um, convey today is that we have a tremendous opportunity to have agency in shaping the impacts of this technology. This is not something that just has to happen to us. We can help shape those things. So how many of you are just tremendously excited to get into an autonomous vehicle, self-driving car, right? There's some of us out there, right? We can nap while we're going one place or another. Uh, we'll be able to like uh, watch a movie, hang out with the kids. Honestly, we're probably all gonna be on our phones, but right, that's all that's gonna happen. How many of you are absolutely terrified of getting into an autonomous vehicle? Right? Maybe you've seen the crash that happened with uh, Tesla uh, or Uber, right? both fatalities. Still things getting worked out, <laughs> absolutely, with, uh, with a lot of the safety and the technology. Uh, I'm actually a little bit in both of these camps, or I'd say a lot in both of these camps. I see tremendous opportunities with these new technologies, and I also see tremendous risks. And not just the safety risks, which my sense is we are going to work these things out, but these risks of these secondary impacts, and it's going to change our cities. It's going to change the value of land. It's going to change our land use. It's going to change how we move around. It's going to change where we live. Uh, there's all these different pieces. It's going to have huge equity impacts. And so those are the things that I want to talk to you about tonight. A question I often get as I start, uh, as I give uh, talks about autonomous vehicles is, when is this happening? Is this real? Is this really going to happen? Is, uh, is this today or is this still science fiction? And this is a great uh, uh, chart that looks at the, the adoption of new technologies uh, across the country. So on the bottom axis is time, 1900s to 2005, and on the vertical axis is the uh, percent of U.S. households that have adopted this technology. And what you see from here is that as we get closer and closer today, the lines get steeper and steeper. When we are, we are exposed to new technologies, when they become available, we take them on much, much faster. It took about 100 years to get to 95% adoption of the telephone. It took about 10 years to get that rate with a cell phone, right? So the moral of the story here is when the technology is available, we bring it on very, very quickly, right? 
So where are we in terms of this new technology arriving? This ancient history time of August of 2016, <laughs> first time in the country that you could get into an autonomous vehicle uh, and take a ride. So this is uh, in uh, Pittsburgh. Uber all of a sudden had uh, uh, autonomous vehicles. Level three automation it's called. So this is cars where there's someone behind the wheel. They're not touching it unless the thing beeps and there's a problem. They take over, right? Um, so this was, this was August. October, two months later, first autonomous freight delivery, beer. Uh, in Colorado, uh, this truck took from the factory to a distribution center without anyone touching the wheel. I don't know if you can see, but there's someone sitting in the back seat of that truck, right? Freight's gonna be a huge one for autonomous vehicles. Uh, in June of 2017, last summer, 10 of the top 11 car manufacturers in the world said that they would have autonomous vehicles to market by 2021, three years from now. At the time, I thought, that's a lot of hubris. That's, there's gonna be some of them that make it, but that's a lot of hubris. In November of that year, Waymo, which is Google's uh, autonomous vehicle company, announced that they were start launching level four automation. Level four automation is there is no one in the front seat. Cars that are moving around with no one in the front seat in the Phoenix area. That was in November. In January of this year, GM went for federal permit to create cars that not only didn't have anyone in the front seat, but had no steering wheel and no pedals. Yeah, that was, that was in January. That same month, Waymo bought 20,000 cars, vans, that they're gonna be using for, uh, to, to sell rides, to, like Uber and Lyft type things all over the country. In May, we're in June right now, right? In May, <laughs> this is how quickly this stuff happens. Um, Waymo announced that by the end of this year, they will have a service in Phoenix that is level four automation, like an Uber and Lyft that you can pick up. So any of us, by the end of this year, will be able to go to Phoenix, punch in in our phone, and get into a car that has nobody in the front seat. This morning, <laughs> literally this morning, it was announced that Waymo just bought 62,000 additional vans. Yeah, this stuff happens fast. It is ha and, and, as, as someone who's immersed in it, I'm completely continually surprised at how fast these things are going. So the technology is coming, and when it gets here, we will adopt it. So what's the impact gonna be? What's that gonna mean for our cities? Um, uh, and I'll tell you, it's going to change everything. So how many of you have one of these? Yes, more or less all of us, right? Uh, and what is your car doing right now? Parked, right? Yeah, because your car is parked 95% of the time, right? So it's for real, the statistic is 5% of the time we use our car, most of the time our car is out being parked. And guess what, you're not alone. Um, there are between one and two billion parking spots in this country. That is between four and eight spots for each car in the country. And if you work in the fields that I work in, in urban design and planning and architecture, um, maybe you've heard the phrase form follows function. Form follows parking. Parking defines our cities, how they're organized, uh, how we, how we uh, uh, develop, uh, the price of land, everything. Uh, it is a huge piece of how cities work. Um, but all that is about to change. The car that, let's say we're you know, a year from now, uh, and the car that just dropped me off and this Thomas vehicle that just dropped me off and I just got out of, uh, now went to go pick up somebody else. Maybe I own it, and it just went to go pick up my daughter and take her to soccer, right? So all of a sudden, this thing that we would usually have right here next to us, um, is can, we no longer need to have parking for it. And that changes everything. That absolutely changes everything. So huge opportunities. On the one side, uh, we no longer need, or we have a ton of room to be developing. All, all the parking lots that exist in the country, largest single land use by surface area in most every city in the United States is all of a sudden up for grabs. So we can start building on those spaces. Densification, fantastic. Um, we no longer have to carry parking as part of our development projects. The feasibility of project goes through the roof. Huge opportunities with all of this. Uh, not only in urban areas, but also in suburban areas, right? So uh, the suburban office park, gone. 
We no longer need all those seas of parking. And why wouldn't then we put the office park into the suburban strip mall that no longer needs the parking so we can actually have some amenities around these things? You get this feeling the whole city is going to transform. Um, huge opportunities for affordable housing. All of a sudden, we don't have to carry parking. Right? I can put more units on that parcel and make it much easier to develop. Huge opportunities for housing here. Um, but there's also a whole lot of land, as I mentioned, that's going to be changing hands or, or open for development. In downtown Portland, not so bad. We've done a pretty good job. We don't have uh, parking minimums here right now, and we don't have that much parking. So that's not, we're not going to see that much impact. What happens when we go out to Gresham? Right? Gresham has a lot of parking. Right? So most suburbs have a tremendous amount of parking in them. Uh, and all of a sudden, that land's going to be open for redevelopment. Uh, now, Portland, Gresham, we have a lot of development pressure in these areas, right? There's a whole lot of, you know, great. More land, more density, great. We can do that. Uh, what happens in Cleveland? Yeah, that's a whole lot of parking, a whole lot of land develop, uh, available for redevelopment in an already soft market. So what this means is that all of a sudden, we've got more land supply and the same amount of demand. If we, anyone studied economics and supply and demand, that means prices will drop. So across the city, prices will drop. All this land becomes available. We're doubling, tripling, quadrupling the amount of available land for development. All these things will drop. And this will have cascading impacts. On the one hand, all of us who own property, that's a problem. And for all of us, um, and for our cities, our property taxes are going to be reduced. We're talking about autonomous vehicles. Property taxes are going to get reduced. Let me just talk quickly about um, uh, the, our commutes. The average commute in this country is 25 minutes. With autonomous vehicles, things change a little bit. <laughs> it's an image from the 1950s when they thought autonomous vehicles were about to arrive. Uh, so with autonomous vehicles, all of a sudden, in 25 minutes, I can go further. Those things are way more efficient than I am. They can go faster. And on freeways, I can go much, much further. So already, I can live a little further out. Oh, and by the way, I don't need to spend 25 minutes doing this with my hands on the wheel looking at the road. I could be sleeping, eating, doing exercise, all sorts of things. So maybe I'm willing to take a 35-minute commute or a 45-minute commute. What does that mean? Tremendous pressure on sprawl. Tremendous pressure, right? So if in all my life, all I ever really wanted to do was live in the woods, or what I really want is a much larger yard, and cheap housing, I can go do that now. I can go further and further out. Well, what does that mean? Well, we have to build all that infrastructure, and we need to maintain all that infrastructure. That is tremendous cost. Cities are already hurting right now with the amount of infrastructure they're building. Um, environmental issues all over the place. More land consumption, more destruction of habitat. Services, all the services are much more expensive to deliver in low density development in suburban areas. And then finally, all that land I told you that became available because of parking, all of a sudden now that we just you know, doubled or tripled that amount of land with the developable land that's on the edges of cities. Right? So again, huge impact on property values. The moral here is AVs are not a transportation issue. Right now, the discussion about autonomous vehicles, and we've been in a whole lot of these all over the country, are mostly dominated by the question of transportation. And what we want to really talk about here is, well, it's a really broad topic. This, this is going to be affecting all parts of our lives. And we need to be able, we need to think about this in this broad part, this broad way. The reason is, one, because it's true, some of the things I showed you just now. And two, because we need to be able to build the political will to prepare ourselves for these changes, to support our cities, to support our communities, to make sure that we're ready for these and we don't get, pun slightly intended, run over, right? by this new technology. So we need to not think of this as a tech issue. We need to think about as an impact in cities issue. Think for a minute, in all the uh, companies that are working on autonomous vehicles right now, how many, of the, how many engineers do you think exist there? Thousands, probably tens of thousands. How many people do we have working on what the impacts are going to be in cities? Very few. I think Portland's one of the more progressive places in terms of thinking about this, we are extremely forward thinking um, uh, in, in many of these things. I could count on one or two hands the number of people whose full-time job is to think about these impacts of cities. We need to change that. So cities that think ahead, 
are going to be staying ahead. And we need to be those cities. We need to, be, we need to have foresight. Uh, we need to be aware of what these things are. And we need to claim our own agency in shaping the autonomous future that's coming towards us. Thank you.